You want to know how to create meaning in a world dominated by chaos? Well, this is the perfect episode for you. Welcome to the Lifestyle.org podcast. I'm here today with Scott Davis, the author of the book, Surf the Sea Style. Welcome, Scott. Hey, I'm glad to be here, Roy. Uh, thank you so much. You're you're in beautiful Colorado today, so welcome. Uh, welcome yes, to the uh, Very nice. Uh, not, not quite as rainy and wet as California right now. Hey, thought who would have thunk that we just come out of a hurricane um, here in Southern California? Uh, some places they get hit pretty hard. Um, but uh, many of my friends there in the coastal cities said, said it was the roughest sprinkle they've ever had to endure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully that you're out of drought for the first time in three years. So, you know, a wonderful unexpected surprise instead of a terrible one. No one's talking about the drought. No one's talking about the drought right now. So uh, that's next week. We'll start talking about the drought again. Yeah. But you know all about hurricanes, I imagine, because uh, uh, you've, you've sailed the, the angry seas quite a bit. Yeah, well, they uh, the ocean will teach you a lot about the limits of your control and your ability to predict, and uh, she's very strong, very strong, and we are very frail. You're 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 a very accomplished sailor. You've done it for decades, but it didn't start out that way. Uh, from what I've read about you, uh, you know, Fortune magazine at age thirty named you as one of the rising stars uh, in in business. Yeah. Uh, you really had a great start, but you gave it all up. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. You gave it all up. You sold your houses. You, you sold your cars. You gave away the keys to your businesses and said, I got to get away from it all. And you got a sailboat and you you took off. Uh, yep. Talk to me about what life was like for you in your 30s leading up to 40, because I believe it was around the age 40. Uh that you that you did this. So talk to me about your life before you went sailing and why did you decide to take this path? Well, I was very fortunate in my early 20s that some super powerful guys picked me up and you know set my career on a trajectory that would have never been on. So I was able to experience a lot of things in the corporate world even before I was 30. Um, that let me see, you know, how that works. And basically you get a playbook and you repeat that playbook over and over and over again, and you do it a little bit bigger each time and you get a little bit bigger reward each time. Uh, and it became pretty clear to me that that was not gonna fulfill me. And so, you know, my early thirties, I set out on my own, created a tech company. Um, the venture capital guys looked down their nose and said, oh, this is a lifestyle business. I said, yeah, pretty much. If you mean by that, I'm going to be successful for my clients and be successful with my family, then yeah, it's a lifestyle business. Thank you. Uh, so did that for a while and then eventually got to the point where my kids were heading off to school and I was thinking, you know, I probably need a complete break from this to figure out what the next chapter is. And I was fortunate enough. I had a great partner, a really great business partner for 20 something years. And he's just said, you know, take off. Why don't you just be gone? At first I said, I'd be gone for a month. And he, before I even got back, I'm calling him on the sat phone and he's like, just keep going. Um, you know, it, it was great. It was a great gift to not ask me to come back and to not saddle me with all those expectations. So, um, you know, a lot of people tell the story as if it's just me stepping away out of strength of character, but fundamentally it was a lot of people around me that just made it possible. Why is it that you felt like you needed that step uh, step aside so. uh you know i think that we start making some decisions in life early on and then it becomes trying to succeed within the framework of those decisions like our prior decisions kind of bound our life our future life you could think about the choices that i make today go in the backpack and future self has to deal with the fact that i made those choices and i think you know the the reality was I had kids really young. I was in my early twenties when I had kids and I tell you what, you look in the eyes of your kid and you simply say, I'll do whatever I need to do to take care of that thing. Um, and so, you know, self went on the back burner for a long time. And so the explorer in me, um, just kind of had to wait. And so I needed to make sure that my career was going great and paying the bills and sending the kids to college and all that stuff. 
But after a while, you have a chance to say, okay, the kids are now where they can take care of themselves. And my parents are not at the point where they need me to take care of them. This might be a golden moment and it might not be around for very long. So I just took the leap and said, I need this. I need some time away. I need to think about who I am, about whether there are other answers to a lot of these questions that we're all saying the same answers on the news and our dinner parties. We're just repeating each other's sentences. There must be another way. And so, yeah, curiosity got the better of me and said, I want to go see if there's other ways to live. Yeah. So the one month turned into how many years? <laughs> it turned into six years. Yeah. Six years. Uh, where did you go and, and what did you learn? Uh, wow. Well, the vast majority of the time was spent in the Eastern Caribbean. So if you kind of just go from Puerto Rico down to Venezuela, there's a whole string of really lovely islands and really lovely people. And I spent almost all the time there. I did spend a couple of years also in the Bahamas. So just North of there, uh, but yeah, that's pretty much the neighborhood of the world in which I spent most of the time. Of course, we traveled the world. Um, in addition to that, we would fly to the South Pacific or to Europe or Scandinavia or whatever. But most of the time was spent in the Eastern Caribbean. That's really where we considered ourselves to be residing during that time. Yeah. You, you say we, who, who was with you? Oh, well, one of my adventures, I actually, uh, I met a woman in French Polynesia um, and she turned out to be absolutely amazing and loved this way I was starting to look at life. And so she came to live with me on the boat in uh, the Caribbean and ultimately she became my wife and she's my wife now. Her name is Elise. Uh, so yeah, Elise was around a lot when we were in the islands. She is terribly seasick though so she can't uh, sail on the boat <laughs> so she would live on the boat and then she would fly when i wanted to you know go sail someplace and i'd say okay well you fly to puerto rico and i'll meet you in puerto rico or you fly to guadalupe and i'll meet you in guadalupe so i sailed a lot by myself out on the ocean at night um, just moving to meet elise on a new island uh, but when i was there then i had you know the company of a wonderful person that's us so that French Polynesia has a very special place in my heart, my wife's heart. We actually, uh, uh, for our honeymoon, went to Morea. Uh, oh, the beautiful Island, place. Right, right next to Dignity. Um, So all this time, you're you're really spending a long time. A long time on the sea is a lot different than a long time sitting on your porch with traffic going by. It does something to you. Uh, when you first started it, I, I imagine it was uncomfortable or just because it was different. But what did you find in that experience of being alone, traveling from island to, to island? Uh, what what did you start learning about yourself and about, about life during that time? Yeah, well, I think the first one that, and this will resonate with anybody who's ever sailed offshore, is... You learn the practical limits of your control, no matter how great your skills are, no matter how fit you are, no matter how smart you are, uh, you are not smarter, you are not stronger, you're not more clever, and you, you cannot stand up to Mother Nature. And so you have to view it not as a conquest. People would say, oh, you conquered it. I'm like, I didn't conquer anything, friend. What I did was... I. I figured out how to dance with Mother Nature. I figured out the, you know, the character of Mother Nature. I figured out how when to, I needed to compromise what I intended to do. So, hey, I, I want to sail southeast today. And she's having none of it. So, okay, well, plan B, sail east instead of southeast. And I'm not going to get to Guadalupe. I'm going to get to Antigua. And you know what? It's going to be fine. Um, and I think that that's a really powerful lesson because of course, you know, successful folks, and I was fortunate to be around a lot of successful folks early in my career, we cultivate this in very small world in which it seems like we are in control, but we are not in control. One of the hallmarks of the guys that were, have been really successful that, you know, changed my life, you know, obviously they're super smart and they work really hard, but I think the third one is really notable in this conversation. And that is they can act despite ambiguity. They don't require a controlled, predictable, total knowledge of the future. And so 
I think that really sets them apart. So many people just stand around and uh, want to make sure that uh, will prove to me that everything's going to work out and then I will act. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you find when you're sailing, obviously, is you can find yourself in a cloud bank, in a, in a fog bank. And you'll think, well, I can't see to the other side of it, so I should just stop. But that's really not the right answer. The right answer is you just continue to move forward slowly because you do have a little bubble of visibility that moves with you. And what happens is that you're just you're moving that little bubble one step further, one step further. So I can actually see one or two steps ahead of me. I just can't see all the way to the end. And I think the mistake that we make in our lives a lot of times is if we can't see precisely how everything's going to go all the way to the end, then we just freeze, just park. Um, you just can't do that. So that's a couple of things I would say right off the top of my head. Yeah, that's, that's totally true, especially in the world that I work in, in television and and uh, in creating things, working with celebrities, professional athletes and authors and experts. Uh, we all get to a point to where uh, everything that we've mapped out, uh, we have to we have to take an off ramp and find another way around. And there's no ways out for your life. So you can't see. <laughs> right there for you yeah there, there's a t-shirt you need to trademark that one there's no ways out for life that's a great one it's true um i just had a conversation uh with some people uh just yesterday where uh i became really adamant and I, i've got to go do some some repair work um because uh i already got a phone call this morning where there was a, a an interpretation of how adamant i was as far as no it, it, this is our plan. This is where we're going. This we're moving forward, even though they couldn't see, you know, the next steps. In order to be successful, every great venture, and the greater the venture gets, the more you get into this realm of the unknown and the unpredictability. And so you have to immediately be able to say, okay, here's where we shift. Here's where we go. But we're not going to stop, and we're not going to turn back. You know, it reminds me that when we were kids, um, when we would say the word balance, it was an active verb, right? Balance this broomstick on your hand. Stand on the seesaw and balance both ends, right? That's actually where Cirque the Seesaw came from, is standing on top of the seesaw and balancing it. But it's active, right? Um, balance this bicycle with no training wheels. They're all active concepts of balance, right? And then somewhere along the way, as adults, we took the pill of the economist and started talking about an equilibrium. Oh, I'm going to take a concrete block and put it under that side and a concrete block under this side. And now that's balance. I'm like, that's not balance. That's boring. So it just takes all of the, the, the dynamism. I mean, think about how a dynamo works. It works by this pulsing back and forth and back and forth. It's not static. And you think about how, how evolutionary biology works. A, a wave of change, which is just an energy pulse, travels into the life of some organisms and they're forced to adapt, which is to grow, to get stronger, to find another way. And somehow as adults, we've just lost sight of this fundamental thing that these pulses of change and unpredictability, they're really, that's the energy that helps us to grow. And we try to ignore that stuff or walk away from it or pretend that it doesn't exist. I mean, to our own peril. That's, that's so true. You know, I, I've had people say to me throughout my career, especially my, my younger career, um, you know, that I need to find balance. And they use balance as a noun, not as a verb. And the reality is that frustrated me uh, for over a decade, because I was looking for this balance. Where's the balance and, and how it's defined for us is balance is finally that place where everything is, is just perfect. You, you, you've got your work here, you've got your rest there, and you found this mysterious intersection between working hard and relaxing. I found it now, if I don't move, I'll stay right. balanced. And it's right. just impossible because balance is a verb. Right. It is not an end. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Totally agree with that. And I think that it sets up this an interesting um, difference between if you think about the kid and the adult. The kid says, "Oh, well, everything's active. Um, my world is huge. I don't know what is out there. I'm going to explore." I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. I'm going to skin my knee. I'm going to skin my elbow. I'm going to cry a little bit. 
but I'm also going to be learning like mad. And then what do we do as adults, right? We drop this cylinder over the top of our lives and make our world so small so that we can pretend that we're in control, but it's just an illusion. We don't actually have control and predictability. I mean, people talk about big surprises, right? Like chat GPT, big surprise, as if nothing like that ever happened before. I'm like, hang on a minute. Let's think back 25 years. So you've been doing this for a while. I'll try this 25 years ago. No Google, no iPhone, COVID, MAGA, Brexit, Me Too, Black Lives Matter. I could just go on and on and on. And that's only in 25 years. It's basically more than one crazy big change every year that you could not forecast. So this idea that you can predict stuff, it's just such a delusion. You can't. So the only strategy is one of adaptation. You cannot plan against a certain future. It's not going to happen. That's that's so true. I well, With the people that I work with, um, it's amazing how many of them are, are trying to control their comfort zone. And the most dangerous thing that they could do is be comfortable. Uh, comfort is the enemy of greatness. And the moment people get comfortable, they get flabby in every aspect of the world. And so this whole desire for controlling to where I am, for example, right now, the big thing is this happiness goal. So I'm happy. I, I, don't, I don't want you to enter into my space with something that would make me unhappy because of your viewpoint or because it makes me, you know, uncomfortable that the biggest, biggest thing uh, right now is that people need to embrace discomfort as probably one of the greatest gifts they can receive in life because it helps, like you don't grow without being uncomfortable. And I imagine you on, on the boat there for, uh, for many years, learn more when you were uncomfortable than when the sea was nice and calm. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I did was I, one of my best memories, one of my best friends from down there was actually a guy who's very different than me. Um, grew up in Grenada, lived in Grenada his whole life, Rasta man, you know, big dread sack. And, um, and his name's Thaddeus. And there's a section in the book on him, just a wonderful old soul. I absolutely loved him. He was a woodworker. And, uh, and, you know, he, he had, you could have a certain stereotype of him if you saw him and you'd say, oh, I, I know who this dude is. This is Ganja Man, right? Like, no, no, this guy turned out to be the, mo the most skilled woodworker you could imagine. The things that he could do with teak and mahogany were just unbelievable, right? And so letting him get past my perception, my preconceived notion, allowed him to bless me not only with his woodwork, but just with our conversation and with his shattering of all my expectations. Like there's this great line that all the sailors use about the Caribbean. They say in the Caribbean, there are only three times it has happened in the past. It is happening now, or it will happen in the future. So if somebody says, Hey, I'll come wash your car at three o'clock PM. Well, you know, it has not happened. It is not presently happening, but it sure as hell is not going to happen at three o'clock this afternoon. Okay. Sometime, but not at three o'clock. But here comes Thaddeus, and he is at my boat at 8 o'clock sharp every day. He works a full day. He takes such pride in his work. And so, again, I think it's just kind of sad when we set up these standards in advance and say, okay, I'm – I'm only at this point accepting, you know, applications for friendship from people who are not Rastafarians. I'm like, well, but then I would have missed him. And so, yeah, our, our prejudgments only hurt us. They don't hurt anybody else. They hurt us. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that's probably one of the most powerful messages that people can listen to today and act on it. We live in a media rich society that is very quick to point out different people of different backgrounds, of different colors, of different religions, of different ways to identify themselves, and immediately begin to parse us out into your difference. So you hang out with those people and your difference. So you hang out with those people. And it's one of the, one of the worst things that can happen to society is to start delineating people groups and saying, you're you're different so you hang out with your different group of people the best thing all of us could do 
is to look for people who are different from us and go invest time in, in those people. I'll never forget uh, when I first learned this last in 1982, the Soviet uh, Union had just crumbled and I was one of the first Americans to be able to go into uh, Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, we had all those movies, Red Dawn, and just basically all the movies of uh, the U.S. getting attacked and who our major enemy was. It was always Russia, right? And they were, they were this big threat, and they were evil, and they hated us. And I show up there and meet the most generous, loving, kind people I've ever met in my life. And, and every single stereotype was shattered. And that literally changed the, the course of the rest of my life in learning that there are a few people who benefit off of making sure that there are delineations between you and other people groups. And the more you can just cross that line and say, I'm going to invest in you, I'm going to love you, and I'm going to find out what, who are you. And I'm going to find out uh, that what I've been told about your people group is not a general truth. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. One of the chapters in the book is uh, is literally on this topic. It's, uh, it is diversity is our species superpower. And really think about it like this. So uh, everybody loves dolphins. I'll use dolphins. What Think about the variety of things that dolphins eat. Yeah, this kind of fish, that kind of fish, a shellfish. I mean, it's pretty narrow. Think about the variety of things human beings eat. Whoa, friend. Play. How do dolphins play? Well, you know, they flip, they surf, they do a few other things. How do humans play? Oh my God, we don't have enough time to list them all, right? Um, well, how do we prefer to talk? How do we dress? How do we act? Who do we want to be with? How do we raise our kids? The diversity of the human species is unparalleled. There are no other species on earth that are as diverse as us. And guess what? That equips us to respond to just about anything that we could find. So we have this vast treasure of experiences and aptitudes and things that we can call on when we have other people with us that have read something different, that have seen something different, have been to a different place. Like if we have all been to the same place and read the same thing and listened to the same news stories, really, how are we going to be able to adapt? It's basically like saying, oh, I have the best set of tools. I have 47 flathead screwdrivers. Well, do you have any Phillips head screwdrivers? No, but I have 47 flathead screwdrivers. I'm like, well, good for you, dude, but you're going to need a wrench and a hammer and a Phillips head screwdriver. So I just see it as our species superpower. People are talking about diversity completely wrong. It is not a tax. It is not a penalty. It is not a social requirement. It is a strategic brilliance. Of course, diversity. diversity. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Diversity is our greatest strength. I think the challenge comes in when people have been conditioned to think that there is one right and one wrong. Uh, there is one truth and one falsehood. It keeps them from having the open mind to listen to, to more information. A lot of the people uh, that I work with, I have to use this common phrase. If you're comfortable, you're confrontable. Because most people are not confrontable. You can't confront them with a different point of view because they, they have no argument. They just know this is right and, and this is what we have to do. And because of it, they become defensive, argumentative. They lose friendships over it. They, they cancel Facebook friends because they can't see those posts anymore. Um, the reality is if open your mind and allow more information to come in, you may actually adapt your viewpoint a little bit um, so that when someone else comes and confronts you, well, you have the, the pillars of what you believe. And so when they say something, you're like, oh, that's interesting. Well, I, I can understand how you go that way. Let me tell you why I feel this way, because here's the pillars of why I believe this way. And let's let's see. I may not have all the information. Maybe you have some some pillars that I need to add to this belief here. And and by doing that, by by being confrontable, uh, it actually makes you more comfortable for the next conversation in the future because now you have more solid foundation on what you believe is true. Um, but this whole belief of I have to stand for what's right 
whether, you know, whether you have new information or not, I don't want to listen to it, is probably one of the most dangerous things for society. Yeah, I think that that's 100% true. And I think that there's this, uh, this thing that I talk about with my friends. I talk about the rule of three. And the rule of three goes something like this. So I tell you something that I think, which is different than what you think. And your first reaction, the first time I tell you is going to be, oh, that could never work. You don't understand. Dismiss me. The second time I'm going to mention this same thing to you, different time, not today, but some other time, I'm going to mention this thing to you and you're going to say, huh, that's interesting. I'm going to think about that. The third time that we talk about that topic, you're going to say to me that you've had a really great idea and it's my idea but I have to be willing to let it be your idea now. And so part of this is to say, yes, on the part of us as listeners, we need to you know, be more open. But I'd also say on the part of speakers, we need to be willing to speak in a moment when somebody's going to say, oh, you have no idea. You don't know what you're talking about. That could never work. To be dismissed is a necessary experience if what we're going to do is to share our Phillips head screwdriver with the person who has 47 flatheads. And that's an important thing. It's going to change their life. It's going to help them. But we have to be willing to go through that as speakers too. Hey, I totally agree. And I imagine you encounter this about the same as I do, that there are a lot of people who dismiss what we say just immediately because that's our psychological human nature is just, you know, especially when it hits the the ego on its way to the subconscious. We, we don't want to rewrite what we already know. And so the defensive mechanism triggers in. But uh, something I, I share with people that was shared with me, uh, I stole it from someone and, and you can steal it from me. Um, but one of the most powerful things you can do in having a conversation with someone immediately is defensive or is ready to dismiss what you say. There's there's a three-stage shift in that conversation that you as a speaker can bring about. And I mean, this is the most powerful secret. You could use any phraseology you want, but basically when you find yourself in that situation, you start the three phrases by saying, I know exactly how you feel. I felt the same way. And then I realized if you use those three stages, what ends up happening is that first moment that you tell someone, I know exactly how you feel. They're like, see, he gets me. And the defensiveness starts going down. You say, I felt the same way. Oh yeah, we're together on this. I can, I can lower my defenses. But then I learned, tells them, well, he has some more information. I'm really curious about that more information. Please tell me, what, what's that extra thing that you heard or that you learned that changed your mind? And now we can have an open dialogue. But you have to basically diffuse this explosive wall that, that the person has there. If you try going directly to, I have more information and you need to listen to me, they're not ready for it yet. You have to walk them down those three steps of, I know exactly how you feel. I felt the same way. And then I discovered. And if you use that in any phraseology, those three stages to help someone diffuse their defensiveness, then you can finally begin to have a conversation with most people. It doesn't work with everybody, but it'll, it'll help with most people. Nothing works with everybody. Now, there's a similar one um, that I like, which is, um, well, I'll just start by saying in, in the book, what I'll say is that uh, the three most important words in the human language, not I love you. I was wrong. Three most important words it's in the human the, language. And it's, it's one, of the, one of the three hardest words to say. Other super, than super, say, super hard. Yeah, other than super hard. Say, People will know. say... People think it's so hard to say, I'm sorry. Try adding, I was wrong to that. And tell, then tell me how hard I, I'm sorry was. I'm sorry is so easy. Like, that's just a cop out. I'm sorry for what? I'm sorry you're going through this trouble. No, like, instead of saying, I'm sorry, say, I apologize. Take ownership of it. I was wrong. I thought X. It was not X. I should not have done that. Um, and so there's this amazing, uh, I think, uh, experience that Parker, my youngest son and I had, he is, uh, he's bipolar and, um, fortunately he's no longer on drugs has been just living a thriving life for, you know, several years since we took him away to the Caribbean to kind of do his walkabout. But I took him, uh, in for a year on an Island. We rented a place and we built a boat. Cause I said, look, you're, we're not just going to sit around and play video games. So let's build a boat. So we built a boat from scratch, me and my son. 
And one day we had spent, it's hot, I mean, hot, hot, and we're just sweating and working hard. And we get the one section of the hull planked, like these little strips of wood tacked onto the frame of the boat. The next morning we get up and we go over there and I can see the lights a little bit different. And I can see, oh man, that that is not going to work. This is going to be a problem later. And so, of course, we did the things that everybody would do. We denied that it was a problem. We talked about how we could fix it later. We could do this or that. Maybe it won't be such a big deal. And then finally, I got a hammer and I went over and I destroyed all the work that we had done. I literally bashed holes in the side of the hull of the boat. And his eyes are just huge. It's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm admitting that it was a mistake. And now we're going to fix it and it's going to be right. And by the way, that boat now, it's beautiful. It's strong. It's still here. It's his trophy. And so, you know, he calls me the other day from his office and he says, you know, dad, I just realized that it's become a real asset in my career to be the person who tells the truth, even when the truth is that I made a mistake. And I remember that that's from the boat. And I was just thinking that what a great picture, right? What a, what a great thing for us to see is that, look, we, we're going to make mistakes. We are human beings. We're going to make mistakes. The dead worst thing you can do is deny them. Denial is just going to hold you in that bad harbor. As a, a boat captain, I would say, look, sometimes you get your anchor down. The harbor is a bad situation, right? There could be rocks, there could be wrecks, there could be all kinds of stuff under there. Your anchor could get hung on that, right? And now you can't get the boat out of the harbor and it's just going to be bad. The storm's coming, you need to move, but you got to get that anchor up. That is denial. Denial is that anchor that keeps you in a bad harbor. You just got to get it up, move on. You can't keep relitigating that, that same old crap. Move on, just admit it. You made a mistake, made a mistake. move on. I'll, uh, let me talk. Uh, about the scientific importance that that we found of, of what you just said, but before I say that, I I just want to say I'm so um, I'm so happy that you're you're loving and leading your your son in the direction he's going. Bipolar. Most people don't know what it is and don't understand how to deal with a family member who's going through it. I just, you, on lifestyle.org, you could see the television uh, broadcast show, Lifestyle, that I just interviewed Maurice Bernard, who's an actor, uh, has been on General Hospital 30 years, played Sonny Corrento's the bad boy, and such an amazing story that he has of being able to, uh, despite having bipolar out, he's been able to not only gain victory, but help thousands of people to uh, basically save their life uh, because people who go through it can easily take their own life. So uh, I encourage everyone who's dealing with uh, either themselves uh, uh, bipolar or a, a family member or friend, uh, definitely watch the episode with Maurice Bernard. Um, it, it really will help you. I, I, yeah, we don't understand. Uh, mental, mental health, health is, is you know really misunderstood broadly, but um, in my experience, bipolar is and first of all, it's a spectrum. People are different, um, and there's different manifestations of that, different challenges they're going to go through. Uh, but the idea that you know this sort of old school view of hey, you have trouble regulating yourself, you just need to get your stuff together. It's just, it's not helpful. And so, you know, if you've sent somebody who's struggling, dealing with balancing their emotions, pinging back and forth between the highs and the lows, the very best thing you can do with them is encourage them to, you know, get some, talk to somebody who knows, talk to a psychiatrist who knows what's going on there. Um, it's one of the most frequently dis misdiagnosed, most, most frequently mismedicated antidepressants or count counterindicated. Um, you just, you need to go see a good psychiatrist um, if you're experiencing that. So if they are experiencing that, please take them. Don't try to fix it on your own. Take them. Absolutely. And and don't try to understand. You just try to help that the person you just can't, that the person going through it can't understand it. They don't understand why did I wake up feeling this way to them. Um, they can't control it. And so it is definitely important for people to understand we're at we're at a great place right now scientifically and medically to not do what we've done in generations past where we just send someone to basically a uh, 
a medical clinic where they're strapped down and kept there. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons that we, uh, that we don't want to, we don't want to see it. We don't want to see it because we have this old idea that it's a death sentence, right? This is the end of your life. If you're bipolar, it's the end of your world. Well, that's just not true, right? There is light at the end of the tunnel. My son, he's drug free. He's thriving. He's creative. He's amazing. He's an engineer. He's an artist. He is doing great. He's socially connected. None of that was in the, was in the forecast. None of that was in the forecast five years ago. None of it. We're looking at it thinking, how do we keep him alive? And now we look at him like, wow, this is amazing. What a wonderful life. And I, I tell people all the time that, you know, uh, if I could see his psychiatrist again, I would say, I, I owe you everything, like everything, what, whatever it is that if you ever need anything, I can't imagine it, but if you did, I would do it. Like you gave me my son. It's uh, so there is that possibility. And once you see that possibility, you don't have to deny it. It's not a death sentence. And so see it for what it is and go get some help. There are many successful people in Hollywood who for several celebrities, you can uh, you can look up on lifestyle.org. Uh, my interview with Lindsay Godfrey, who's a very successful actress, uh, has been on the soaps for for years and years, and she is thriving. She's doing amazing. But her challenge was she was not diagnosed until uh, I think she was senior year of high school uh, before she got diagnosed. And so, if you're noticing. Uh, any issues of just not being able to control your your wounds, your emotions, whatever. It is so important to go see people today. And like what you mentioned, Scott, um, it's it's not also a life sentence to uh, prescriptive drugs. Um, I think it's really important for us to do as much as we can without drugs um, because the side effects may <laughs> bring it. Well, no, there's set of problems, but like you said, yep. um, there is a path to being able to manage it even without medication there is we've walked it yeah. it's possible yeah that's amazing. well thank you uh this was a this is a part of the conversation I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah. hey you know what i love unforecastable moments you never know i'm gonna i'm gonna learn you're gonna learn it's gonna be great absolutely well this this is what makes conversation with people like you so powerful you were mentioning about anchors um, before before we talked about this. I, I think it's so true that we unwittingly uh, have these anchors that keep us right where we're at. Uh, what we found is that in the three, and this is generally speaking, so I'm going to simplify it, but in the three parts of your mind, you know, the conscious mind that operates 5 to 10% of your life, you have the subconscious mind, which operates around 90% of your life. That's why when you're driving and you look and you're like, I don't remember the last three turns to, to get to work or to home, uh, your subconscious was driving and they've proven that your, your subconscious mind is a better driver than your conscious mind, which is scary. But uh, when you zone out, they, they say you're actually a better driver and your subconscious takes over. But in between those two, it is this layer called the ego which uh, we use ego in a derogatory sense, as if someone's got an ego, whatever. But your ego is actually a really good thing. It, it loves you. It wants to protect you. And if I were to uh, make it into some sort of physical object, I would make a shield. It's trying to shield you from life and death situations. But it cannot recognize whether something that's just causing you discomfort or stress is life or death. It just knows this could and so it tr it anchors you into these moments it anchors you in relationships it anchors you in a job because the fear of if you step out this could be life and death and so it actually breeds uh this condition that is becoming quite a buzzword after the pandemic but narcissism and it there there is a spectrum of narcissism that if you anchor yourself with these things because of the fear of the unknown, um, ultimately everything can be a threat to your life, including family relationships, uh, people at, at work. And if you find yourself being offended 
it incredibly frequently. Uh, this is one of the first signs you can reverse it, but you have to choose to reverse it um, because those anchors will, will will truly make you miserable. Yes. Uh, so I started the book uh, with a chapter, and the name of the chapter is um, Fear. Fear creates monsters. And I've gotten so much feedback on why in the world would you start a book on the topic of fear? And, you know, so I'm off living in the Caribbean. I'm sailing alone at night on the big ocean, right? And you would think that's terrifying. And sometimes it is definitely terrifying. Um, and we're dealing with pirates and all this kinds of stuff, right? But here's the thing. When I came back to the States, all I could hear was fear. Because I have been living in a space where, yeah, some bad stuff can go wrong, but there's just not constant messages trying to get me to be fearful. Like you think about Madison Avenue, they even have an acronym for it, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So you're slinging FUD if you're creating ad campaigns that are trying to make a woman think, hey, you know what? I'm going to be alone if I'm not beautiful and I'm going to be not as beautiful as I could be if I don't buy this thing to put on my face or to have my hair or this clothes or a guy you know, to be a real man, you need to be big and strong. So you need to buy a gigantic truck that you really don't need, right? Um, it's all based on fear or MAGA based on fear, or you just name it on any political spectrum. The church is famous for using fear. And the problem with fear Go back to your cognitive thing. The problem with fear is that it takes this wonderful prefrontal cortex that we've got, that we've evolved, and it shuts that sucker off, and everything is now being processed back here primally. In other words, fear turns you back into an animal. So the reason someone's using fear on you is to get you to turn off your most sophisticated thinking. So you just need to say no. No, there really is no reason to be fearful. Remember the book, um, we all had to read it in middle school, right? Lord of the Flies, right? So there's this totally harmless thing that's out there and these kids see it and they're like, oh, what do they immediately do? They concoct the most elaborate fantasy story about why they should be scared of that thing instead of just walking up to it and poking it and go, oh, it's just a parachute, no big deal. We do the same thing. We think we're so much better as adults, but we do exactly the same thing, right? And so, yeah, I would say you start with fear and fear manifests in a hundred different ways and none of them are good. So my, in, in the book, what I would say is fear creates monsters, not the other way around. So you see a fear, my advice is you go up and you poke it because you're going to find out it's probably not what your brain has created this amazing story about what that thing is. Just go poke it. It's, uh, I, I'm actually, when I looked at your book, I was very happy to see that you started with that chapter because every life change comes from having a positive attitude. And you cannot have a positive attitude at the same time that your mind is in fear, like what you mentioned. Uh, we've, we've placed, you know, electrodes on people's uh, brains and, and put them through situations that we measure what happens to you physically when you're in these moments of fear. And it does trigger, just like what you said, the animal brain, which uh, emits the beta waves. Most people today are operating in the beta state, the, the, the wavelengths, which at a low state, it's it, it's it's okay. You're, you're still relaxed. You're driving your car. But then when someone cuts you off, now you're in the second stage of beta. You're, you're more alert. And, and now you're you're looking out for you know uh, danger around you, but the fear messaging and everything from seemingly positive things from COVID vaccines to uh, what's happening politically, what's happening in weather, uh, things that are messaged to you as I'm here to protect you, I'm here to help you, I'm here to save you, anything that triggers a fear response takes you into the most unhealthy, unrealistic, high beta wavelength that literally makes you not be able to have the cognitive function if you're just sitting there being presented both sides at the same time and asked your opinion of which one do you think is the best route to take. When you're in the state of fear, you have to act now. That's why if someone was coming to my house to sell me windows today, 
the guy, if he's a good salesman, will use fear. He'll say, look, uh, I've got these windows. They're only on sale. Today is the last day the sale is here. FOMO, fear of missing uh, out. <laughs> taking clock, taking clock in. Have you seen the the uh, the rates of electricity? They've shot up this much percent in the past year, and they're projected in the next four years to quadruple. Do you have enough money in your budget to pay four times what you're paying for electricity today? And if you don't do it now, you're going to pay that much then. Fear is the greatest motivator. And so that's why politicians use it. Media uses it. Anyone that, that's trying to sell you something, fear is the quickest way to get you to make a decision right now. Yep. That's it's cool. basically, they're just trying to get you to turn off your brain. So anytime that somebody starts using that language, you just need basically inoculate yourself against it. When you hear fear-based language, just like, okay, that's fear. What are we really talking about here? Just set it aside. Now, what are we, we're talking about windows. We're talking about um, work permits. We're talking about housing. We're talking, I mean, whatever we're talking about, it's housing. It's one of the things that I think is so terrible. And it's in the same domain of getting your brain to turn off is that everything becomes a symbol. Nothing is what it is, right? And so we talk about how someone wants to talk about immigration. Well, the way that we're talking about immigration is as a symbol. It's a symbol of something, but it's not as what it is, right? And we talk about the government, the government as a symbol. The, the government, I mean, what does that even mean, right? Specifically, what are we talking about? But we we use these, these words as if they correspond to something else undescribed, right? And we've seen this before, like we've seen this used for several thousand years in various cult circumstances, right? Where somebody says, oh, well, this thing is really an indicator or a symbol of this other really bad thing that's out here that can't be poked or prodded or tested. It's in this untestable region of whatever. Um, and we do that with everything. I mean, we do it with so many things. Like um, my son the other day was like something practical. He said, you know, it's kind of weird to me that all these apartment complexes talk about their brand as if this is almost like Shangri-La or heaven or something like, oh, if you move into this place, you're going to be so happy. People are going to want to be with you. And he's like, isn't it just absurd on its face? I'm like, yes, it is absurd on its face. It's shelter. That's It's shelter. That's what it is. And I guarantee they're also saying we only have one or two more of these <laughs> exactly a, and a you know list. you might you, you might not have been here yeah <laughs> you'd be very lucky to get in here <laughs> yeah i think that's true you know uh, it's also bringing back this idea to me you're talking about um cognition i'm thinking about jonathan Haidt's work um the righteous mind and just such a great book and one of the things that it ties back to my experience is when we were down there we would meet um, people and they would say, oh my God, you're sailing around the Caribbean. I love that. I've always wanted to do that. Maybe someday I will. And we would always say to them, you know, you can do that. Here's all that it requires. You have to be willing to set aside everything that you have right now and go down there because you can't bring that with you. So you just have to be able to make that bold move. And this brought me to the conclusion that, you know, most of those people will never do it. They'll talk about it their whole lives. They'll have the best of intentions. And then that leads you to the question of, okay, so imagine that you have died and someone is delivering your eulogy. And um, think about what a lame, awful, sorry, pathetic eulogy it would be if they got up there and said, oh, let me tell you what Roy was planning to do. Oh, he had the best plans that Roy, he was going to go to, you know, solve hunger in Africa. He was going to fix the political system. Oh, he had the housing system nailed. He just was, oh, if we'd only had a few more years with Roy, I'm sure those plans would have come to reality. I mean, that is pathetic, right? No, what we're going to do, you want him to talk about what you did, right? What you did. And the thing with Heights book that's so powerful is to realize that our intentions, they're just like a little game that we're playing in our head. 
we don't know why we do the things we do. Like we act and then somebody says, well, why did you do that? And you concoct this crazy elaborate explanation that has nothing to do with why you acted the way you did. And so to me, I come back and say, then all these stories we tell ourselves about who we are and what we're going to do and why we do it, total poppycock. What matters? Act. What did you do? What did you do? So good intentions just becomes an opiate, right? It makes me feel good. Well, you know, I intended to help you. I'm so sorry that I hurt you. I'm like, well, your intentions don't matter anything. You hurt me. That's what matters, right? Well, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't intend to run into your car. Well, you were driving 50 through the parking lot. Okay. So it's your actions, you to drive matter, not your intentions. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't in intend to drive safely. So what did they? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Intention has nothing to do with it. Did you or did you not? End of story. Yeah, I think you're you're really touching on a a, a sweet spot that for me I'm extremely passionate about. I uh, you know in in my previous work for for decades I'd be at a at a conference and some up front would be talking about this new innovative way that they're doing this and how incredible it is and what the effect that it is on this. In uh, uh, about 15 years ago, I was at a conference. I, I raised my hand, and I was really excited because that it sounded great. It was wonderful. I was like, "You know, can, can you just share with me where and, and when you did this?" It wasn't a gotcha question. I was really curious because I wanted to follow up. And uh, he goes, "Well, we haven't done it yet, but in theory, on paper, th this should work." And that oh. was like that, that. That was like the the straw in the camel's oh. back for me to where it <laughs> it affected me so much that I even even in like our our uh, television production board meetings I don't ever want to talk about where what we're going to do I only share what we've done um, because I don't want the people around me to feel the same way I felt felt about that guy and several of the people before that they're always talking about what they're gonna do what I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. And for a while, it's it's the opposite of credibility. You have anti credibility to me because they're they're just these people that are always talking about what they're going to do. Show me what you've done, and then I I want to find out from you how do you do it and get your advice because I want to do something. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's it, it's this real trap. The that when I'm working, I, I work with highly successful people, so it. it probably will surprise you, Scott, to, to to hear some of these extremely successful people that I do life coaching with, um, that they're caught in this fear of, I know what I want to do. I'm just afraid that I'm not going to succeed in it. And for me, that gives me a whole market of people to work with to help them understand how do you go from that desire to do and go around the obstacle of fear. Um, what, what did what really worked for you to kind of help you get around your fear option? Good. Well, I think that the, the most important thing for me was to realize that I didn't have to create a vision that corresponded to my present skills. So uh, when I sold everything and bought a boat, I did not know how to sail. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm talking about a 50 foot, 20 ton offshore vessel, and I now own it and I do not know how to sail. So I went to sailing school and I sailed big boats under the tutelage of people who knew how to sail and I learned how to sail. And then I got on the boat and realized everything on that boat depends on a couple of diesel motors. And I don't know anything about diesel motors. So I went to diesel maintenance school. It just... Over and over again, I don't know anything about electronics. Well, I need to figure out how to do that. I don't you just basically say, instead of saying, these are the skills that I have, and I'm going to choose a tiny little vision that corresponds to the skills I have, because that makes me feel better. I'm rather going to say, you know what? I'm a pretty elastic human being. Think about where I've come from. Think about the things that I've learned and the things that I've done. It wasn't always perfect, but I got there. I bet I can get to this other place. So I'm just going to start walking and I'm going to trust myself that as I can see a little bit further into the fog, oh, you know what? It's going to be important to know how to maintain that diesel motor. Okay. Reservation diesel school. Um, 
just one step at a time. And it doesn't have to be obviously that dramatic for people, but it's a dramatic example that you choose a path that you want to walk toward. And then you accept the fact that what you are right now almost certainly isn't sufficient, but you don't know what you're going to need until you start walking down that path. And then you acquire the skills and you acquire the friends and you acquire the collaborators and whatever it is you need and you get there. Yeah, that's, that's, absolute peaks of success right there. Um, I, I think the important thing for people to understand from your experience is this is the, the very roadmap to success. Um, if you are going to be successful, you always have to keep learning. I mean, there, the, the, the people that live in the good old days conversations, and I have conversations with them all the time They call me up that we went to school in, at university or, you know, each other. Yeah, they always want to talk about the good old days about things are. And if you want to talk to them about their life today, they don't want to talk about it. They just want to talk about the good old days because they've put their learning on pause. They haven't they haven't continued to evolutionize the life. And they're literally just stuck in that moment. Good memories. They're not making new memories. They're not excited to talk to me about what they just learned and what they just accomplished because they fed into the lie that society tells you that you get your education, you get your job, you get your beautiful house, you get your spouse, and now you settle down. And life is not about settling down because if you settle for anything, you're going to be miserable. It's about always, what's the next step? What's the next thing you're going to learn? What's the next accomplishment? Especially if you're male. If you're male and listening, this is incredibly important for your own personal ego, your own personal understanding of who you are, is to constantly put yourself in a place that you need to ask for help, you need to get training, you need to figure out who is somebody that can teach me to do this thing I don't know. And your very sense of yourself will be so much more positive not knowing things than if you get yourself in a place that you know everything that is your surroundings. You know, you talk about, uh, when you're talking about glory days, and I'm thinking about, of course, I'm hearing Bruce Springsteen in my head, but what I'm thinking about is, you know, the the pass I threw in that playoff game in high school, and I'm thinking, okay, now, what I want you to do, totally fine to start there, but what I want you to do is, I want you to rewind back to the first time you picked up a football, because you didn't throw that perfect tight spiral into the back corner of the end zone, right into the arms of your receiver. You didn't, you threw it and it wobbled all over the place and it went about five yards. And between that and here, there was coaching and there was failure and there was running sprints because you did something wrong and you didn't study the playbook. So the coach made you run five miles and there was weight training in the weight room and there was film and there was all that stuff that led up to that moment. And so Honestly, your glory days, it's not the day you threw the pass. The glory days is all the work that you did to improve that hunk of potential, but no skill, took this lump of potential and you turned it into skill. That's the glory. The glory is that you made these choices that took you from just a lump of Play-Doh and made you the person that threw that perfect pass. If we can change that dialogue, then I don't mind so much about the glory days thing. But if all we're focusing on is the past, guess what? There are no future passes that you're just going to teleport yourself into this circumstance and go, ha, here we go. I'm the guy. And I'm like, no, no, there's going to be a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous amount of failure that gets you between here and there. So, yeah, I think that that's where, you know, you talk about being open to other people with different points of view and different experiences. Um the objective is not to win. The objective is not the pass into the back corner of the end zone. The objective is to not be that hunk of Play-Doh with untapped potential. That's the objective. So how do we say, oh, well, I can go from whatever Play-Doh I am today. I can get a little more skill, a little more perspective. Oh, I'd never thought about that. Oh, that sounds like an interesting book. Oh, that's an interesting place. That's an interesting person. Everything should be interesting to us. Like think about kids. They think that electrical outlets are interesting. They think pots and pans are interesting. They think the cardboard box that the gift came in is interesting. 
as adults, we're like so blase about everything. We're like the cool kid in high school. Like, yeah, I'm too cool for English. I'm too cool for math. And that dude is pumping gas someplace, right? So we don't want to be that guy. We want to be the guy that's curious, that's learning, that's not too cool for new stuff. Yeah. If you're the same guy that you were five years ago, you're not growing. And the, the, the goal of life is, is to grow. And specifically, it's to grow in your compassion for other people and to figure out ways to, to bring joy into other people's life. And if you're the same person that you were five years ago and you haven't met new people, you haven't been in different cir circumstances to, to challenge your worldview, you're stagnant. And the easiest way to get out of it is just get out of your comfort zone and go meet more people that are different from you and find ways to grow in your compassion for those people groups. Uh, people groups and you will continue to find joy in life. Yeah. Let me tell you a story about that. So a lot of times we see um, being open to other people as something we give them. Well, I was in the South Pacific. I was backpacking. Um, this is back before I met my wife and um, I was, I had gotten onto this Island, had a huge mountain. Nobody had climbed that mountain in, I don't know, decades. And so I hired some local guides and we, climbed this mountain. It was amazing. Um, and I came back to recover at this little hotel, some bungalows around a pool. And I came out one day and there is this absolutely spectacularly beautiful woman in the pool. There's nobody else at this place, right? So of course I strike up a conversation with her. She says, oh yeah, well, uh, I and my friend are on this yacht. We just arrived as crew and we came up here and just asked the manager, could we use the pool? And we're not guests. And I'm like, cool. So we just strike up a conversation. She says, you know what? We haven't had a shower in like 30 days. So is there, you think there's a guest shower? I'm like, no, there's not a guest shower. But here, you guys just take the key to my cabana and you go over there and you can take a shower. And, and so they go off and they take a shower, come back, bring me my key back. The next day they invite me to, um, you know, go around the Island. And so we are going around the Island. I rent a car, we get some fruit, we do all this stuff. And then the shipmates, they had me, um, they took me out to dinner as a thank you for just being kind. And the captain of the ship is this curmudgeonly old dude, right? Just cranky, crusty old dude. And so he says at dinner, he thinks he's mocking me. He says, so tell me if, uh, if it had been me instead of those beautiful women that ask you for the key to your shower, would you have given it to me? I said, you know, here's the real challenge. Would you have asked me? And he said, of course not. I wouldn't have asked. And so the point is his pride would have prevented him from asking for help. But now here's the rest of the story at night at dinner. They're telling me about their adventures. They're telling me about how life exploring the islands on a boat is. And I am so enthralled. That's why I ultimately bought a boat and it changed my life. So these people who needed something from me to use my shower for like 10 minutes, nothing, gave me inspiration that changed my life. I mean, no exaggeration, not like, oh, yeah, it changed my life. I mean, no, really changed my life. Like everything I owned before, gone. Totally different trajectory, brain reworked. So my point out of that is just to say that these, these people that need our help or these people that have a different perspective, it's not just us, you know, hitting them with some knowledge. It's not just us sharing something with them. They're going to turn around and bless your socks off. In my experience, at least five times out of 10. And the other five, I look at it as like, whatever, it was a free option. Yeah, it's it's so true. Um, I work with a lot of people who you would think would be the happiest, most joyful people because they have everything that the rest of the world seems to be wanting. Same, they've got screen time, they've got fans, they've got more followers than, than you would imagine ever having Twitter. And yet they're just not fulfilled. Uh, it's, it's happiness. Well, that old, uh, what's the old Latin, uh, you know, know thyself. Yeah. That's a pretty tough one, right? Um, it's pretty hard to be true to yourself until you know yourself, but knowing yourself is, um, it's extremely difficult. We latch onto these concepts of identity and 
Um, we let those things define us. And I think, you know, I told somebody earlier today, my youngest, my oldest son, when he was younger, he was basically the prototypical jock. I mean, big strap and fast dude. Um, and so we could have pigeonholed him into that, right? We could have said, okay, yeah, Hunter is the, Hunter's the butch guy. Um, so now fast forward from that to now. So Hunter went to the University of Chicago, double major in economics and physics. He got his PhD in physics from Caltech. He did his postdoc at Harvard. He's the chief scientist at a biotech firm in California. He's not a jock. He's the least jockey person you could imagine, right? Um, and you're like, wait, so these people these little people, they're like an example for us of what they can become. And we can't sort of judge them or see what they are and say, oh, I, I know who you are. Well, imagine that you take this little kid and you tell them your identity is a jock. Well, now I've taken this whole world of possibility and I've just narrowed it down to this little bitty thing right here. And we do the same thing with ourselves when we start talking about our identity, right? Oh, you are a media host as if you couldn't be something else. You could be many things. I'm not saying anything, but you could be many, many things. Uh, remember, I didn't know how to sail. I am a sailor. I'm a very accomplished sailor now. And so uh, you can choose to evolve your identity over time by collecting new skills, collecting new knowledge, collecting new friends, having new experiences. Um, you are not stuck in the you of today. Of course you're not. That's, that's true. I, a, a lot of people say the most powerful word in the English language is yet, because if you put it at the end of a negative statement, like I can't sail, or I don't know how to, uh, how to say it. I don't know, uh, if I'll be able to leave my job, whatever. If you add the word yet to the end, I can't say yet, it still keeps your mind active and saying, but how can I? So I took that concept and shifted it. My words, I you know, two words myself. I school. Hi. And um, whenever they say I can't, I always say uh, that word's not allowed. The phrase is how can I? So they have to change, for example, if they say keep or the single line, they have to stop and say, how can I afford that? And it literally triggers a different part of your brain and the solution comes. And you do things that your typical brain says, I'll never do it because I can't. And, and you're living proof that uh, once you stop saying it again, uh, you, you figure out how do, how do I learn? Who has the skills that I can learn from? I think that's true. You know, there's this, um, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine last night and we're, um, we're talking about, uh, creativity generally. And, you know, it's related to this idea of development and learning and acquisition problem solving. And, you know, the word that we're, we're on, we're talking about last night is glimpse G L I M P S E. If we just get a glimpse out of the corner of our eye of something interesting, what do we do with that? Well, as adults who are hyper-scheduled and hyper-focused, we're like, background, 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 background. I don't even notice it, right? But as a child, you're like, ooh, interesting, right over here. And you drop your books and you miss class and you do whatever, like, that's interesting. And I think that there's something that we've lost in um, losing that instinct, like the next time that somebody that you, somebody forged you something, you're like, oh, really, this completely stupid pseudoscience thing? I'm like, you know, just read it. Just read it. At a minimum, it will give you insight into where that person is coming from. At a minimum. Somebody sends you something that's, you know, some, you know, uh, for my parents, it would be, uh, you know, situational ethics, right? That would just drive them kind of bonkers. And so I could say, okay, well, here's a Joseph Fletcher book. And they could say, ah, oh, throw it away. I'm like, come on, guys. How about you read it with me? Just read it with me, right? Let's read it together. We'll have something to talk about. Um, so reading new things, watching new things, try a different news show, try a different radio show, try listening to some different styles of music. It's remarkable what that can do. Just simple little things. Last night, I picked up a book that I hadn't, I mean, I never read anything from this author before. 
And I opened to a chapter. I literally read three sentences and it stopped me in my tracks. Three sentences. And I closed the book. My wife said, wait, you just sat down to read. And I'm like, yep. And now I'm going to think <laughs> because somebody just gave me something wonderful to think about. Uh, so that's just, that should be our impulse. Our impulse is, oh, that's novel. Not, oh, that's novel. Yeah. I, I, I think the important thing, especially for today, is as, as we're encouraging people to be open to more information, more books, more new sources and, and more places for, for information. I think one of the important filters that I'm having to encourage is if the new information that's being sent to you to, to see is anti something, for example, if it's political and it's saying vote for, for my candidate because they're not as bad as this guy and you point out all the bad things about owning or you need to follow my beliefs because let me point to the opposition belief and this is why they're evil. It's it's not saying I'm pro this and here's my reasons why I think this is a better way of life. This is a better solution. This is a better tool. It's pointing out how much horror and, and worse something else is. So you need to go with me because they're horrible. That's negative um content yeah. there. And it's not positivistic i mean bunch, yeah yeah you want to get a, get rid of as much negative editorial comment uh and content that you can that you can and surround yourself with positive people who have solutions people have a great idea that say hey why don't we try this or why don't we think this way or here's why i think you should support this candidate is because here's some here's some positive things that that they're promoting and that they've done and it's it's a it's a positive approach. So I always tell people, you'll be handed it because I'm emailed and handed and people tag me at things. I constantly am tagging myself because it's negative first. It's saying I'm anti this, anti that. Um, Mother Teresa herself, when uh, she was asked, why are you marching in this anti-war rally? She said, if you have a pro-peace rally, I'll be there because she understood the danger of anti. She understood the danger of negative uh, messaging because the more you're talking about what you don't want, the more you see it and the more it comes into your life. Yes. The thing that uh, human beings are fundamentally is we are creators. That's, we build things. This is what we do. We, we build sandcastles. We paint our hand and put it on a cave wall. We build the Eiffel Tower. We, build a spaceship to go to the moon then we build things um you do not you do not get to the moon by saying oh i'm anti-earth yeah. you get to the moon by understanding rocket trajectory and by understanding material science and so we need somebody in whatever the field it is not just to say hey this is bad I mean, it's okay to describe a problem to which you are then going to offer a solution. But by the way, the solution is not unproblem. <laughs> That's not a solution. If, if you want to be a creative that creates things, you have to surround yourself with positive messaging. Otherwise, you're a critic. And a critic cannot create. I, I always joked that over the decades that the movie critics that are on TV show me your blockbuster and then you have credibility for me to tear down this other blockbuster um yeah show me what well, it's a really lot easier to critique than to create a lot easier yeah it's, there's no such thing as a gift of critiquing uh, um it just doesn't exist <laughs> yeah what would you say in your entire experience and and as you've written uh this book of 30 essays on on what you learned um what what would you say probably is the message you hope people take home when they when they read your book. <laughs> if I, there's only one, it would have to be that the meaning of life has nothing to do with power, it has nothing to do with money, it has nothing to do with fame. The meaning of life is accessible to every single human being. There will be a unique meaning for you, a unique meaning for me, a unique meaning for every person. I don't tell you what that is. No person outside of you tells you what that is, but we can all, we can all create a meaning. And 
the key thing for me is to realize that everything that we create, entropy is like this little cosmic eraser that comes and erases everything that we create, right? So I could build a house and entropy will cause it to fall into disrepair and fall down. I could build a business, entropy comes along. I could record a podcast with you. Entropy will eventually come along and erase that thing. But here's the thing. <clears throat> if I sit here in my office and I write my book, and it's just my book, and there's only one copy of it, and I never share it with you, and I never go on your podcast. It's pretty easy for entropy to erase that. Just one spot. All I got to do is erase that one book, and it's like it never even existed. Scott never existed. But I come on your podcast, Roy, and I talk to you. And now, a little bit of me is in your head, and a little bit of me is in somebody else's head because they listen to this thing. Well, now entropy's got to go erase this podcast. It's got to go erase the person who listened to this podcast. And so... The point here is just to say that if we are about empowering, enabling, energizing, sharing, collaborating with other people, we're taking a little bit of our existence and we're the evidence of us and it's over there and now it's over there and it's over there and it's over there. We're making a difference um, because ultimately the only proof that we exist is that the world with us is different than the world without us was. Well, I want that difference to be in millions of people's lives, even if it's a little one, in millions of people's lives. Entropy is going to have a hell of a time erasing that. So the meaning of your life fundamentally is going to be greater and last longer if you're about impacting other people that are around you, helping them in some way, inspiring them, sharing something with them. I think that's the meaning of life. I love that. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, for those of you who are watching, definitely get Scott Davis's book, Search the Seesaw. We have the link right here in our description, and uh, we'll have your website right there, Scott. Uh, is it, it, any other way that you would uh, like for people to connect with you and what you're doing? Uh, well, there's a website, surfetheseesaw.com. You can connect with me there directly. You, um, I also blog on surfetheseesaw.substack.com do that every week. Um, so you can sign up for that newsletter. That's free. Um, and like I said, you can contact me directly if you have something you want to talk about. Awesome. We've had such an incredible experience and uh, it's so neat just for us to be able to be blessed by your sacrifice, your experience, uh, your daring to, to go do this. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you so much for sharing this time with me on the lifestyle.org. It was super fun, Roy. Thanks for the invitation. It's great. Anytime you're in Southern California, please let me know. We'll, uh, we'll be I'll do that. Because I, I can talk take to you, you about pro that. probably another another 20 hours. And, uh, yeah, and just I feel the her. same way. Uh, all right. Well, we've got, uh, I'll find a way. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching the Lifestyle.org podcast. If you'd like to view more podcasts like this or to see our television show, Lifestyle, or even go through our never-ending blog post, uh, please go to our website, lifestyle.org, and continue this journey with us. Also, want to remind you, please smash the subscribe button and the like button. It helps other people be able to find this and to help them live their best life possible as well. We'll see you next time.